sun in my face. Hello, you who make the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of the tulips and in the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the most miserable and crotchety. <laughs> Best preacher that ever was, dear star, that just happens to be where you are in the universe. To keep us from ever darkness, to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Watch now how I start my day in happiness and in kindness. Lying, thinking last night how to find my soul a home, where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone, I came up with one thing, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone. All alone. Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their wives run around like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone. But nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone. All alone. Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering, and the wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering, and I can hear them moan, because nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone. All alone. Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Thank you. 
America singing. The varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his planks or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter song. The plowboys on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or of the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day, but at night, the party of young fellows, robust and friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Even before you check out from your extended stay Airbnb, I hear your voice. Now, sometimes that voice has focus and a sense of reason. Sometimes the voice is just plain loud, but I always hear that voice. Your cry lets me know that breath is flowing in and out, and I hear your voice. You get nine months to get used to the idea of leaving that warmth and security, but aren't really sure what it will be like on the outside. And I feel your tiny head. Soft and vulnerable, your head fits in my hand, and I embrace what will one day become your brightness, your wit, your intelligence. Imagining the miracle that brought you to the world healthy from microscopic speck to almost seven pounds, and I hear your heartbeat. You're wiped clean, you're placed in my hands, and stare at me with a, now what, (laughs) expression. And I can feel your gaze. Brought nakedly into your new societal and cultural clubhouse, though somewhat reluctant to have your membership card punched, Again, I I hear your voice. Our eyes truly lock with a sense of meaning for the first time. Me in pale blue scrubs and you wrapped in a striped hospital blanket. And I quickly come to realize that I love you more than evolution requires.
Thank you so much. And uh, I want to say, a, a, first of all, say a, a wonderful thanks, word of thanks to the, the, this terrific series here. Um, and, uh, and a special thank you to, to Paul for um, uh, allowing me to come visit. And, and this is actually the second time that I visited. I was here last October with my, and my wife was able to come with me and we had a wonderful time here for a couple days meeting uh, new friends and reconnecting with some old friends. And this is certainly, you know, this whole community as a whole is just such a special place and to be a small part of it for a few days is really a pleasure. So I'm, I'm thankful to be here. So uh, Paul asked me if there was something that um, I wanted to talk about with you all. And before I do that, I just wondered, I, since I have you here, I wonder, do you all have enough insurance? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm sure. You, I'm sure you do. Uh, yeah. But I'm reminded reminded uh, of a, a story that uh, I'd heard before, but I became took on new resonance when I when I read read it in a, a, a book recently that uh, David Brooks uh, com, uh, wrote. And it's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, called How to Get to Know a Person, you know, and Be Known Yourself. It's, it's a really wonderful book. Maybe some of you have read it. If you haven't, it's definitely worth the read. It's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful book. And um, he, the, the whole premise of the book is, is essentially how to be a better listener and how to be, uh, and also how to add things in conversation, oftentimes with people that you don't know, people that you're, you're meeting for the first time, about how to uh, interact with them in a way that's really truly meaningful and it isn't just surfacey it isn't just like well i you know I, I don't there's no really real reason for me to smile at this clerk because i'm i'm in a hurry and i, I gotta I've, I've gotta get off to the, my, the to meet the needs of my and the demands of my day right but it's it's a really wonderful book and so um what i wanted to talk about today is developing listening skills particularly as a musician, but I think it just serves in a, in a certain kind of way. The more I think about this topic, the more I realize that it really is a metaphor for the way we listen to one another all the time in our, in our daily lives. And, it's, um, and, and being a good listener takes, I think, a, a real sense of humility and a sense of awareness, right? So in, 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 in Brooke's book, I'm, 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 I'm freely stealing from, from him, but it's a story that I had heard before of the, there's this Ivy League scientist who's, you know, and, and, the, and the Amazon, he's in Brazil, and he's at the bank of the Amazon, he's like, you know, collecting some specimens at the river bank, and uh, there's, he, he looks across the other, other side of the river, he happens to look up, and there's a woman that's running, and she's being chased, she's got a pretty good lead on it, but she's being chased by a tiger, right? And so she's running and she is scared. And he's like this kind of self-important puffed up guy and he's collecting you know, ants and collecting stuff. And he hears this woman say, how, 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 how do I get to the other side of the river? And he goes, you're on the other side of the river. You know? In other words, he can't, he can't see past his own immediate awareness to see, oh yeah, to, for me, this is the, uh, yeah, yeah she, so she needs to be safe and I need to help her. I don't just need to give her a, give an ancillary answer to something, but I really need to, 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 to be of help to her. And when we play music, as many of you in this room do, we sometimes, you know, when, when we first start playing instruments, are challenged by our great, fantastic, and very well-meaning and very well-directed teachers is to develop your ability to play your instrument, right? In other words, you know, how, how to make a good sound, how to play in tune, how to, you know, how to, you know, play fast, how to play slow, how to play high, how to play low, all those things. But one of the things that is missing, and I, I noticed this with, with my students too, is, is developing kind of a curated sense of really how to listen. So if, you, if you're in a conversation with someone, and I'm sure we've all been there from time to time, you know, you have someone, you, you're maybe with a person or maybe with a group of people who don't really ask you any questions. They talk at you a lot. Maybe that doesn't happen here this much because I, I know what a, what a really, really, you know, thoughtful group of people habitate, you know, this, this, this part of the Cape. 
But, but oftentimes, I think in, in, in most, most of the time in real life, we'll find that where we're, 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 we're with a group of people where there isn't really a whole, always a whole lot of interest in getting information about who you are, right? And sometimes you, know, you might go to a, like dinner at a, a friend's house with maybe a, a group of people that you're not particularly close to and you, you leave like, man, I, didn't, I, I know a lot about other people, which is great, but nobody even asked me one time like who I was, what I did, you know, it's a little uncomfortable, you know. So, as I say, as young performers, our goals mostly center on building a, a skill set that allows us to play difficult music at the highest level of proficiency. The time, this time-honored tradition uh, that measure musical achievement has been auditions and competitions. Those are the things that we tend to really kind of judge one another by as our success in those areas. And we understandably spend an inordinate amount of time perfecting fundamentals on our instrument, as I said, developing technical proficiency and learning repertoire. But the important, but operating the instrument, as we just discussed, is really only half the journey. The sometimes forgotten part of the equation for musical success is learning how to listen. And by listening, I'm referring to four basic tenets. And again, I'm talking about in a musical context, but there's a lot of room to think about this in a much, in a much broader context than that. So the first thing that the tenet that I think of when I think about listening is, is the art of discernment, what we ourselves sound like, right? Or in a conversational way, you know, gee, what, 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 what am I relaying to this person and what's the space that I'm giving them to, you know, to be able to respond to me? Second is finding that knack for making a positive contribution to the musical fabric, or we sometimes refer to it simply as fitting in. Third, appreciating what to listen for when we're listening to recordings. And um, again, this is from a musical standpoint, but there, there are certainly other contexts for it as well. I know as I was growing up, a lot of times, especially this is, is true in the jazz area, you know, people would say, oh, you gotta listen to Miles. You have to listen a lot to Miles. You have to listen to Miles Davis. Oh, well, that's great. What am I listening for? You know, that's, and that's a very honest question. So instead of having an, an assigned kind of sense of, okay, these are the things I want you to really listen to when you listen to this recording in an attempt to learn, I want you to listen to the way Philly Joe Jones uses his hi-hat. I want you to listen, and listen, to, the, listen to the entire track of, 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 of this great re record and listen to how that happens. Then I want you to go back again and I want you to listen to the way Tommy Flanagan, the great pianist, comps behind Miles Davis. Or I want you to hear the way Miles solos. How much space does he leave? How much, how much does he play? How much does he not play and let the others shine? Those kinds of things. Though that's a good sense of having a guided, a guided sense of listening. And sometimes, our, our you know, well-meaning teachers say, oh, you, you need to listen to this. Well, okay, I, I'm right there with you. I want to listen to this, but why? What am I listening for? Help me. The fourth thing, uh, the four, fourth tenet that I'll, I'll maybe submit to you is, is, is actually is how we talk about music with other musicians. You know, how do we talk, talk about it? Do we, what are the values that we show when we talk to others about, about music? Is it, is it just, oh wow, listen to how loud those guys could play or those gals could play. Or, you know, wow, listen to how fast that tempo was. Or are we able to like dig in a little deeper than that and just look past those, those things? So some important questions for us to consider would, in, would include, you know, why do we neglect the importance of good listening skills? And why is it important to be a good listener? And I think we can probably agree that it is important to be a good listener. And then how do we go about teaching this fine art of, of listening? They're all, all, I think, good questions for us to answer and, and kind of expand on today in the next four and a half hours. No, I'm just kidding. In, 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 the, next, in the next little bit. So from a, even from a cultural and non-musical perspective, we're, we're just not always the best listeners. I, I think we can probably agree with that, that there are times when we kind of phone it in when it, when it comes to that, that, that skill set. You know, in a conversation, we often concern ourselves with a self-generated contribution of spoken words without really realizing that a conversation can't happen unless there's one speaker and at least one listener. So how many times have we found ourselves noticing that when we want our conversational partner to be listening to us, 
right? That, uh, and listen to us with empathy. We instead feel that they instead are kind of looking past us and thinking about what the next thing they're going to say in the conversation, right? Listening requires concentrated awareness, humility, and finding value in the other and in the moment. So again, borrowing from Brooks, he, he, he talks about um, this uh, friend of his who teaches at University of Chicago and talks uh, his in listening and, and developing social interactions in a more positive way is this, this person's um, particular um, uh, specialty. And so he, he uses the, what he calls his arm analogy. So he says, you know, if you think from your, your fingertips to your shoulder and you think of this as the length of the conversation, most people stop listening about here. And then the rest of the time they're kind of shut off because they're thinking about the next thing that they're gonna contribute. They're not really thinking about what's in the moment. And that's, that's, that can be human nature, I think. So we just have to, have, to, have to kind of battle that, I think, and battle that tendency that we all have in this get it done, let's keep the conversation moving kind of way, you know? So I'm sure some of you have probably experienced this in a personal way and maybe in a musical situation as well. Listening on a personal or musical level, either one requires us to put as much stock in the community as we do in ourselves. Now, evolution actually has us, in a certain kind of way, I think, has us wired to be contributors to a community, to travel in packs and be part of a herd. And as St. Augustine reminds us, a community is a multi, I love this quote, and some of you I'm sure probably know it. A community is a multitude of rational beings being united by the common objects of their love. That's really powerful to me. A community is a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. Now, a tribe, on the other hand, is usually a group of people that are unified by what they dislike. You know, that's, you know, why, why that, you know, we hear sometimes with politicians, et cetera, we hear, we, we, we hear being spoken that they're very tribal and that's not particularly a compliment. But music requires community, not tribalism. And I want us to just uh, think about for a second this very simple task, okay? We're gonna just very, uh, very easily together, I, I want us to all say, the Pledge of Allegiance, okay? Now, we haven't rehearsed this. And if you want to stand, you can, but you don't have to. I mean, we're just doing this for, we're just doing this for, uh, for the, the sake of, of, our, uh, of our discussion today. So I'm not gonna start you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cut you off. I'm not gonna pretend I'm a conductor. No, no, no. I just want you to, you to do it. Go. Wonderful. So, um, welcome to America. No, just, just kidding. So, you, you, you very quickly, right, from years and years and years of doing that, you know, you very quickly find mutual cadence points, you find a rise and fall of the phrase, and, and, and you're, you're able to very quickly come together on that. We have kind of a common understanding of that. But saying the pledge is built on a type of oral tradition. Right, we're, we're, we're used to kind of, you know, nobody reads the pledge or, or not, not many people, maybe new citizens do or something, but, but you know, we've all been saying it for so long, we don't say it. And maybe we've had a similar kind of experience when we're saying a prayer or when we're singing in church, like I heard last night at 915, so beautifully done. You know, people are used to singing together and, and without a whole lot of prompting, they're just able to do it, right? How beautiful is that, right? But now let's see if it will work with something that we are less familiar with that requires us to listen and read at the same time. So I think in your, in your program, you'll see that there's a, a little paragraph uh, that's, about, that's all about you know, one of all of our favorite Americans, Abraham Lincoln, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just get us started, but I'd like us to read it together and see if we can't really just come right together like we're one voice, as I'm sure you will. Okay, I'll start with you. Abraham Lincoln was an American
wonderful. So there, it's a different kind of experience, right? You're not saying something with just having a, an oral tradition uh, in, your, in your, your mind's ear and then reciting it, but you're do, reading it and doing that, right? And it's, it's, it's isn't it, un, it can, can't it be a little uncomfortable when we're in experience like that? Maybe you're saying a prayer in church and, or, or whatever. It could be any, any number of, of situations. That's just one that becomes really apparent to me. And there's someone who just will not stick with the herd. Have you ever had that experience? I have, you know, in, in there's, there's someone who's such a beloved person to me, but, but every week it's like, you are like three words in front of everybody else. And it's kind of driving me nuts. I mean, nice, nice thoughts to have while I'm sitting in church, you know, but it just, but it's interesting how sometimes we lack that awareness. We don't, we don't have that gene or we haven't developed that, that gene. And, um, and, you know, that's, that's fine. And, and life's like laundry list of importance, it's about 914th, you know. But at the same time, it just, it shows sometimes what, what, we, the, what we sometimes um, uh, allow, allow ourselves to do if we're not really thoughtful about what we're doing. So you can see that our natural tendency is to want to fit in and create something that's really actually larger than ourselves. But over the last 50 or 60 years, um, it seems like our culture seems to be pushing us in a different direction. And society invites us to invest more and more in the importance of self-affirmation and in an ever-increasing sense of self-worth. Nothing wrong with either of those things. But as I was in the, uh, in the session that I had this morning with the wonderful brass players here from uh, this area, you know, I said, you know, when you're, when you're playing in a group, you know, the sports analogy, you have to care more about the name on the front of the uniform than the one on the back of the uniform, you know. And so, and there's a lot of truth to that when you play in an ensemble or when you're with a group of people. And I'm sure that that's a, I know, I know for, for a fact that in this area that uh, in, in with the people that I'm familiar with, that's a value that's lived out every day. But that doesn't happen necessarily everywhere. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with being focused on ourselves, certainly, and, and our ability to look outward and value the contributions of others with a sense of humility and modesty has markedly lessened. So kind of our egos and have that sense of self-gratification are watchwords that, that are holding a more prominent place in our daily lives than ever before. And this, um, the reason I'm, I'm rolling out all this sociology is because I think it re really it really stems into our music making. So here are a couple examples of what I mean. In a 1950, and these are from a, an article that I, I read not too long, uh, long ago in the New York Times. In a 1950 Gallup poll of American high school seniors, this is so this is 1950, so uh, almost 75 years ago, 12% of those polled declared themselves as important people. When the same poll was taken in 2005, that percentage had skyrocketed to 80%. In a recent poll of American college professors from many disciplines and many different types of institutions of higher learning, private schools, uh, public universities, um, uh, community colleges, what have you, many, many trade schools, many different types of institutions, 96% of those who were interviewed said that they possess above average skills in the areas of teaching and research. <laughs> okay, so Google and other search engines, of course, and you know more about this than I do, I'm sure, but they provide a service where books and magazine articles are scanned to measure word usage. So in the last 20 years or so, there's been a, a skyrocketing and sharp increase in words that denote a sense of individualism. Words like self, personalized, myself, me. The frequency of more communal words such as really plummeted during that same time in the last 20 years. Words like share, kindness, community, common good, and incidentally, economic words are on the rise, as we might expect. So we, we read more about producti productivity, output, profit. And that words that hone in on our morality are also declining. Words like bravery, gratitude, humility, etc. Now, random facts like this point to a kind of a concerning migration away from caring communal, uh, a caring and communal mindset. 
And this mindset takes its toll on our ability to be good listeners. And if this phenomenon is kind of shaping our culture at the most basic level, you know, what makes us think it wouldn't also affect the way we make music, among other things? So the good news that we demonstrated in our reading and in our speaking exercise is that our natural setting for most of us is not to be this way. We really, you know, we have that sense of wanting to be part of something that's larger than ourselves if we just allow ourselves that kindness. So, you know, anthropologists remind us that the most notable signs of the formation of a civilization are not cave paintings or the invention of implements or tools, but instead the advancement of a civilization is often, can often be measured by looking closely at fossils and skeletal remains to, uh, that are found in archeological digs. And when scientists first discover that a human being's femur has been broken and healed, okay, it was a sign that ancient peoples had reached out to one another. And, and so, in other words, the only way for, the, for that kind of healing to happen is for another person to pull the injured person out of harm's way, away from the water buffalo or whatever, right? And attend to the needs of their fellow woman or man. So sometimes we, 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 we think that you know, some of the signs of, of what really tells that we've arrived as a civilization are those, those other things that I spoke about. But, but that's actually for a, a lot of archeological uh, folks and for um, uh, historians and stuff, that, that really points to them, uh, to a sign that, um, that a, a civilization is really evolving. So let's talk for just a second about how to listen. And I'm gonna speak mostly in a musical context, but it, 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 it so fits in so many other areas. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Malcolm Gladwell. He's a, one, yeah, he's, he's a wonderful writer, kind of a sociologist. He talks about trends in our society. And I, several years ago, I actually happened to, um, I said this to a couple of friends uh, a, a couple, couple days, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, like Barack Obama told me to never name drop, you know? <laughs> so think of that for just a second, right? <laughs> okay, so good, you're with me, good. So, but, so I'll, I'll say this, that Malcolm Gladwell, I had the good fortune to meet totally by accident in a coffee, uh, coffee shop in the Berkshires. And he, you know, if you've ever seen him, he's kind of in mistakeable, has this unmistakable countenance. He's this kind of like, really kind of got lots of nervous energy and he's like a toothpick and he has a kind of a big hair and, 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 but, and he's, a, he's a very handsome guy, but he has a very distinguished look. And I approached him and he was, could not have been, not have been nicer. I didn't want to bug him and uh, let him, you know, uh, destroy his uh, cappuccino experience, but I, I did want to say hello to him. And he was, he was incredibly gracious. Well, in his book, Blink, it was written in 2005, he gives us this phrase, the keys to good decision making is not knowledge. It's actually understanding. Now we're swimming in the former, but we're desperately lacking in the latter. Right? So it's a little bit that whole, whole thing about someone who's smart and intelligent and someone who's wise. Right? Those are two very different things, as I'm sure we would all agree. Both, both are, are, are wonderful attributes, but they're, they're different gifts. So deep listening is a complex act, and it requires us to interpret a product as a whole while simultaneously concentrating on the fine granular details that that comprise that whole. So it takes years of experience to achieve that depth of understanding in, in, in musical settings. The great French-American trumpeter Roger Boisin, who was the principal trumpet of the Boston Symphony from the 40s up until the, the late 60s, and then he remained in the orchestra for another six or seven years after that, said that when he joined the Boston Symphony initially in 1935, actually I was wrong, it's in the 30s, he was 17. His father, Rene, was also in the orchestra. But when he first joined the orchestra, he claimed that he didn't really know how to listen, and he didn't really listen across the ensemble until he became principal trumpet of the same orchestra 13 years later. So he's just kind of in this trumpet section playing third trumpet or fourth trumpet, and he's just trying to match what's going around, uh, on, around him, but he's not really investing in what's happening in, in the rest of the orchestra because yeah, it's, 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 I don't really need to know that, you know. But 
it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important uh, nonetheless. Developing the ability to listen with a discerning sensibility requires us to first define the difference between our objective values and our subjective values. So by objective values, of course, as we all know, but just to, to put it out there, so make sure that we're, we're, we have equal footing. I'm talking, when I speak about objective values, I'm talking about facts. And they include, again, if we're talking about, I'm talking about in musical terms, are you playing the correct notes? Is your intonation good? Is the steadiness of your pulse, you know, uh, you know, is that is that is that something that you're that you're doing well? When the music calls for it, of course, are you are you you know exercising you know good dynamic contrast? All those things. Those are pretty objective. They're they're facts that are on the page, right? Subjective values or more opinion issues. They include the sound, the type of sound or tone color that you might be playing with your use of vibrato, the way you articulate or start a note, or the way you end a note, the length of a note, the f shape of a phrase, blend and balance, those are all, all those subjective things uh, are, are, are enter into the picture as well. And it's important for us to, to not push elements of a very personal subjective nature into the commonly sourced objective world. So in other words, oh, this person has a sound that's different from me. And they're not a very good player. Or this person is, is really articulating this in a way that's kind of different than I'm used to. Yeah, I know that's a subjective, subjective quality, but I'm just going to make the, the snap judgment that they're not a good player. It's, and sometimes it can be really sad. And that happens, of course, in, in, in our lives all the time with when we, when we hear little bits, and especially in our polarized world that we are right now. We might hear that someone you know, backs a, a candidate or has a political view or whatever that we're not in, in really in touch with or in tune with at all. And I'll, I'll be guilty. I'll, both, I'll you know, say that I'm guilty of this myself. It can be very easy to kind of like pull back away from, from that person. And instead, the, the best thing to say is, yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. Tell me more about, about why you believe that. That's interesting, you know? But we, a lot of times we don't allow ourselves to do that. We, we, we stop. Another common thing that happens, I think, a lot in music is we, we get so concerned with the page. We get so concerned with what I would call kind of worshiping the page. And we put all of our stock into the, into the objective things that are on the page. And that's all very important. But we can become very, very rule-oriented very quickly. And when that happens, we kind of lose some beauty. And we, we have to lose our, our, use our power of discernment to, to really help us to get there. So the, the thing, the example, it's kind of a dumb example, but hopefully it'll have some resonances for any of us who have t taught our kids to drive, right? So you're, you know, you're, you're teaching your kids to drive. You have to signal here, and you're going to come up to this intersection, and the intersection is going to be either a red light, which means you have to stop, or a green light, which means that you're going to go through the intersection, or a yellow light, which means you step on the gas. No, I'm just kidding. So a, ye a yellow light, which means you, know, you have to be very cautionary about, about what your move might be, right? There's a little bit of judgment that has to get thrown in there. So you know, we teach our, our, our kids or our grandchildren or whoever, we teach them these important things. But what really makes, makes those rules work is that there is if they're also paired with a power of discernment, right? So in other words, well, my, my, my mom, my dad told me that if the, the light is green, that I go through the intersection. So I'm going to step on the gas and I'm going to go through the intersection. But what do you do if there's like a baby carriage in the middle of the intersection? You don't just plow through it, right? You have to use your judgment. So there are rules. And they're important to, to, that we have those rules. A dotted eighth note is equal to three eighth notes. So, you know, what, whatever that rule happens to be. But at the same time, we have to we have to to be so comfortable with them that we have the a sense of discernment about when we can kind of veer around those rules because it just makes more common sense to do that, right? So it's great to to have you know, our, our preferences about, you know, what we believe and, and, and how we want to follow rules, but our subjective values should not be mistaken for objective rules. So I'm going to just take a second and speak about developing strategic skills in three areas. And again, I'm going to be talking about music, but I could be talking about a lot of different, different things. We're just kind of using, you know, a music as a metaphor. So 
uh, the things that to think about are some are listening to ourselves in real time, and maybe when we listen to ourselves in recordings, like how do how do I really go about doing that? Listening to others in real time, okay, and then listening to recordings to for inspiration. Like how do we how do we go about doing that? So here's some hints for listening to ourselves in real time. By that is mean just in the moment as you're playing. How do, you, how do you listen to yourself? And, and maybe if we listen to recordings of ourselves playing in an ensemble, like how do we, how do we listen to ourselves? What are, we, what are we trying to do? So we can all, I think, relate to the difficulty of judging what we're doing in the moment. You know, it's impossible to have our filters working all the time while we're also trying to be a creative entity especially uh, in the early stages of our development. There were a couple of young people that joined us this morning and they, they did a wonderful job. And I think this would apply, this would apply to them. That this is the reason that recording ourselves is so important because it allows us to make artistic creative decisions knowing that we can step back and listen to ourselves as an almost, almost like we're a different person. So uh, having that ability to record ourselves maybe from a church service if you're playing or singing and you're like, oh yeah, the, you know, the, the tenors were really a little out of tune here or, oh wow, that was really great the way our consonants lined up so beautifully in, in, in this, right? It can be very affirming and it can also shine the light on things that maybe we want to try and do a little better. So as we listen to recordings of ourselves, and I spoke about this just a, a little bit ago when I was making the Miles Davis um, analogy, we can segment our listening assignment. In other words, with multiple listen listenings of the same recorded passage or, or the same passage that's played in real life in, in, in real time, we can assign ourselves specific tasks by concentrating on different elements of the music. So, you know, maybe, maybe this time through a, a particular passage that you know a conductor is, is going to ask an ensemble to do repeated times, you're thinking, okay, this time through I'm gonna really concentrate on sound quality, my own and how it, how it kind of interacts with the other sound qualities around me. Or you might say, okay, this time I'm really gonna key in on, in on dynamic contrast. Or you might say, hey, this time I'm gonna think about intonation or phrasing, whatever. If, you don't, if we don't do this, the act of listening can seem too overwhelming and actually kind of oppressive. And there's a lot of stimulation at one time that we're faced with, right? So we have to develop that sense of, of kind of segmenting our listening so we just don't feel overwrought and, um, and overburdened by, by the, the task at hand. One effective strategy that I find in, in, in individual practice to help with this is to develop a balance between what I call white collar practice and blue collar practice. So what I, what I mean by that is if we, we think of the, the work that we do on our technique, work on like just making sure we're identifying the right notes, make sure we're playing things at the right time, all this stuff, we're kind of like digging a ditch. You know, we're kind of just there, we're doing the hard work, we're figuring things out. We're gonna, we're gonna try and, and, and put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's so important because the, then in turn allows us to have a more what I, what I guess I would call a white collar, a slight, slightly more erudite approach to things. So we've done the hard work. Now we're gonna to start to make some artistic decisions about, about what we wanna do. We're actually gonna think more about, not just about the nuts and bolts, but how this piece has to be performed. And they're two very different skill sets, right? There's, and, and I find that a lot of times my students at the college level like to do a lot of this. They like to do a lot of work on fundamentals and all that stuff, which is incredibly admirable. It's great, right? But sometimes it's, it's then gluing those all together and then making, um, making a, a, a musical statement, a musical gesture that has some meaning to them and to the people that they're playing for, not to or not at, but the people they're playing for, have it make some, have it make some sense. So one of the things that, that I like to ask my students and invite them to do is to, um, is to make sure that part of their practice is met as practice as a performer. 
So I want you to, to have the ability to really, you know, okay, you've done all the nuts and bolts work for the first hour or wh whatever, you know, mythical number you want to want to use. Now we're going to take some time. We're just going to run through this piece. We're not going to stop. We're not going to fix things. We're not going to correct things. That's for another time in your practice. For right now, we want to really think about how this is going to, how this is going to sound as a, as a group or how, how it will sound as an individual if you're playing a, if you're playing a solo piece. So this may sound a little strange, but you know, in an effort to develop these segmenting skills as listeners, one thing to try is tr to try practicing with a sporting event or a podcast on in the background while you're, while you're for a little bit of your practice to see if you can actually play and listen at the same time. Now, mature listeners can switch back and forth between the contrasting worlds of passing listening, passive listening, which is kind of for entertainment, you know, we're all, we're at a party or we're in a lobby of a, of a, you know, of a, of a, of a store or something and there's music that's piped in and it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of part of the wallpaper. So we have, you know, we have that sense, but we also at times, especially as musicians, we have to have an aft, active and critical sense of how to listen to establish higher artistic standards. And both of those are great. Both of those types of listening are, are great, helpful, and meaningful, but we have to know when to plug into the, to whichever of those uh, is necessary in the moment. So here's some, some uh, thoughts about how to listen to others in real time. And again, this has musical implications, but it has much greater implications than just that. We have to be so comfortable with our own part, that we can devote the largest part of our very finite brain power into listening to others with a greater sense of awareness. So we can't be so focused on what we're doing that we don't have the ability to, you know, that we don't have the ability to say, you're, you're, you're on the other side of the river. What's your problem? You know, <laughs> like, the, like the scientist in the Amazon, right? Like we have to, have to be able to have that, that awareness that there's something a little bit bigger than ourselves happening out there. As a musician, it's imperative that we know our musical role in a piece of music at any given moment. Gee, am I the melody? Am I the accompaniment? Am I playing a bass line? Am I, am I just kind of punctuating um, the, the fabric of the, of the piece just to give a little bit of color? What, what's, what's my role? What, what, am I, what am I supposed to be doing here? Right? And, and it's important to know the roles of the, other, of the other people that you're playing with, the other parts that you're playing with. So my, my son is an actor and um, you know, I'm reminded when my extensive conversations with him about, about what he does that you know, when you're in high school and you're doing Our Town or you know, some wonderful play, you know, it's a moral victory if you just learn your own lines, right? And you, you know, you're in the middle of like, you know, AP social studies and like, you know, you're, like, you're, you're trying to like, I just gotta learn my, and you're practicing your instrument or do whatever. It's just a moral victory to learn your lines. But as we all know, that's just the very beginning. We need to not only know our, own, our lines, but we need to know the lines of the other people around us so that our character that we're inhabiting has a chance to really interact meaningfully and take in the information that another character is sharing with us in the moment, right? And so we, and it's not enough to just not just know our own, our own part, but we have to know how it fits in with what else is going on around us. So uh, oftentimes, another thing can, that can help when it comes to listening to others is to play through pieces that you might be playing. And, and we did this yesterday and we did this today, which is really great. And I, I hope to think, like to think and hope that it was helpful. We play through pieces in smaller groups. So in other words, if you're playing a piece that's for an entire wind ensemble or an entire orchestra, maybe the trumpets and the trombones just get together and they play through their parts so you have a, have a better understanding of what else is happening, right? So, you know, and you don't, you don't have the, the, um, uh, the, the, the difficulty of having to sort through the whole orchestra, but you kind of listen to each other in, in a little more intimate kind of way, right? So paring down the, the uh, ensemble that you're playing in and really listening to the to parts in smaller chunks can be really helpful to help listen to one another. 
And again, if you're a musician, score study is very important too. In other words, and it kind of gets back to what my, my son's in my conversation, knowing the entirety of the, of the work, not just our little part of it. And so for any of you who are musicians, I know many, many, many of you here are, when if you're playing a piece, say with piano, uh, that you you will most of the time you'll receive a solo part that has just your music on it and then there's a piano score so the pianist of course has the full piece in front of them so it's always it's always been beguiling to me that like that pianists are expected to not only their know their part but yours too but we don't have that same kind of sense it's like nope a concerto means that I'm out in front, I'm large and in charge, and everybody's just going to kind of follow with what I do. It's like, well, not really. The word concerto comes from the word concert, together, playing together, right? So if you're playing a concerto, it's an opportunity to, to you, know, you know, put your gifts under the tree with somebody else's or, an, or with another group's and, like, make something larger than either of you could uh, individually, right? So score study is, is so important. Uh, sometimes in a, if you're playing in a group, and this has multiple meanings, you can, um, you can try different physical setups. So like maybe, you know, we always set up with the first player here. Let's set up just for a second. Let's set up with the play, first player in the middle of the section so we have a chance to like hear how she or he might be leading the section and we can kind of clue in a little better to what, to what they're doing, right? So never hesitate to try different physical setups. And uh, we also make music better when we play accompaniment softer rather than inadvertently forcing the melody to be played louder or more forcefully, right? We, we, wanna, we wanna make sure that the, the melody is heard without a sense of strain, but that we really, that we really are able to play under, under melody at a, at a, but with a supportive you know, sense. So to paraphrase Malcolm Gladwell, good listening is about assembling as much information as possible and then acting on that information with a sense of urgency, right? Having a real sense of like, yep, I've got all this information and now I have my mar marching orders. I know what I need to do with all that information. So just to wrap up, uh, hints for listening to recordings. Right for study purposes, and I, I know because um, I've heard some of you talk about. It, I know that things get recorded here on a, on a regular basis, and I'm sure you all, people who play in ensembles, have the opportunity to kind of check in with what with what you've uh, with what you've done after the fact. So, um, you, as you're as you're listening back, you have to be first of all aware and ask yourself, are the judgments that I'm making right now, are they based on from an objective standpoint or a subjective standpoint? In other words, oh yeah, somebody you know, just kind of stepped in that hole that was supposed to be a group rest. Or yeah, you know, we're, we're playing in the key of, of A flat, but somebody keeps playing D naturals. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a problem, that's a very objective thing. Or is it more subjective? Hey, we need to let that phrase breathe a little bit more, and I bet we can do that successfully if we, if we think about it a little bit more uh, with a with a, a sense of sense of, of togetherness with our thought process. So other things that can help as we listen to do recordings, and again, it could be of, of your own making or or uh, other ensembles or other other artists you might be listening listening to. If you listen with a sense of awareness of the whole, in other words, context really matters, right? So we have to have to listen listen to the the entirety of things. And, I've, I've had this experience before where, you know, I'll play something and I, in the moment I won't be in, incredibly happy about it. And then I give it a little bit of time and then I listen again. And it's like, you know, actually as a whole, that kind of washes over me in a much more positive way. Cause I'm a little bit removed from the, the immediacy of, of just having done it. And I, yeah, I, that it's what, what concerned me uh, 72 hours ago doesn't bother me quite so much because there's so many good things that are happening in the entirety of the of the of the of the piece of music. Segmented listening is critical because decisions are best made when we listen to the to the whole. Then we like listen to things in in uh, in a, in, a, in a smaller segment and then we listen to the whole again. And that sm the smaller segment that part aspect of this format can really rotate between different musical elements as we as we spoke about so i'm going to end with uh this great duke ellington quote and it's uh from 
uh, a publication that was called The Most Essential Instrument. It was published in 1965. And Ellington says, he's talking about music, but again, it can relate to so many different things. S excuse me, soul is very important. And first, to play music, you have to love music. So if you love music, then it follows that you love to listen to music, which makes our ears the most essential instrument, the most essential musical instrument in the world. Right? So before we can start to make decisions about the way we want to play, the way we want to interact with other people, the way we want to come across to other people, we first have to really be good listeners and like take the information in so that we can respond in a way uh, that, that really makes us realize that our ears are the most essential kind of musical instrument you know, in the world. So um, I hope that there's a, some small way that what some of the things I've talked about, even if you're not a musician, have a sense of resonance for you and like, oh yeah, I never, maybe I never quite thought about it like that. But it's, um, it's, it's a subject that I really care about a lot and something that, that I work on with my students a lot and I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's, um, it's a, the fabric of the conversation is ongoing and, uh, and I think it's really helpful to think outside yourself just a little bit more. It's, it's healthy for so many ways. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank Mark. If anybody does have any questions, we might have four or five minutes. And if you do, I would just ask if you go to that microphone in the center of the room so that people listening at home can hear it. But if not, any there, questions? There are no bad questions. Well, there are a couple. But <laughs> we are li we are listening, Mark. Yeah, exactly. Listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but anyway. Even if you don't, if you don't want to get on mic and you want to ask if you, if there's anything that I can answer, you know, please don't yes, don't hesitate you. to ask before you before you leave. Say, oh, we have one brave person. Good. How, how did you fall in love with listening? How did I fall in love with listening? Yes. That's you know that's a really good that's a really good question. And you know what? I don't think I did until you know maybe 25 years ago or so, maybe a little longer ago than that. But I think. Uh, it really was a, is a sense of, I think, of being aware, again, not to keep banging the same drum, but of being aware that there's so much more out there than just our own little, little, you know, aspect of what we do. And I think that having that kind of an appreciation is, uh, it's, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's just important. And I came to that realization. I, and I found in the last few years uh, that that's really deepened for me a lot. And I, um, I find myself like when I'm, when I'm talking with, with friends, uh, with family, that I try and talk a lot less and listen a lot more. First of all, I really enjoy it and I want to know what's happening for other people. But it also, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's a richer experience because we probably talk more than we think we do, but, um, but listening is, is, is just a, a, a great way to not only gain a sense of what someone else is going through, and it, again, it could be musical, it could be otherwise, but it's also a real gift that you're giving to another person. How many of you have had this experience before where you're driving on a long car trip, right? And maybe you're like, you know, you're gonna drive like, you know, cross country or you're gonna drive to wherever, right? It's a long trip. How nice is it if you can be in the car with one other person and you feel so comfortable with them that you don't feel like you have to fill up every second with conversation? You can just sit in the silence together and enjoy it, right? And so sometimes when we're with new friends, new people that we don't know a whole lot about necessarily, or we're not yet have that sense of comfort yet, we, we feel compelled to want to always keep the conversation going. We've got to keep the balls up in the air. You know, we have to keep that going. And that's totally understandable, but how nice it is if you can really kind of um, explore that gift of you know silence, which I'm sure many of you do, 
um, explore that gift of silence and really have a sense of feeling settled and just know that, yeah, we're in the same place together and it's a shared silence and wow, how great, how great is that, you know? Hey, do you need to stop to go to the bathroom? Okay, great. Another half hour of silence, you know? We just, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great gift that we give each other. So, yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, James Scott, I think. Just to Oh, that's a really good question. So I'm sure you probably all heard it, but he asked, what, what was my, who is my favorite musician slash listener? I have a, a good answer. I think it's a good answer. I'm a huge fan of, in jazz circles, he's very well known, but maybe in the, you know, in the general public, he's not as well, well known, but there's a really great valve trombonist named Bob Brookmeyer. And I really, I, I enjoy, I got to meet him a couple times and play with him a couple times. And he, as a, as a jazz soloist, for example, when he's playing, he always sounds like he's a composer. In other words, he always sounds like what he's making up as, as an improviser. And you'll, this is a, a great entree into the world that you'll share with, uh, with my dear friend, Chris Azera, who will be here in April doing a similar kind of, uh, a similar, having a similar kind of experience like I've had the good fortune to have here today. But he, when he constructs a solo, it's, it's, it sounds like he's actually, he's not just playing something that kind of checks the harmonic box that fits in with what's going on, but there's a real sense of, oh yeah, this is like, it, it, this is like something that could have been written out. It's so cohesive, there's so much, uh, each phrase builds on the next one very logically, and, and you know, also he's a, um, a jazz player that like really invests in silence and like stopping and listening to what else is going on before he steps back in the fray and tries to add to it. So I, th I think he's someone who immediately comes to mind. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it's nice to have those models regardless. And sometimes maybe there's a, a person you love the way you, you see them interact with other people, or maybe it's a musician, maybe it's a, you know, an actor or whatever that you, you know, that you, whose work you really admire because of the way they're able to have that, that ability, their characters have an ability to be good listeners. You know? Any other questions anybody have? All right, seeing none, you're, we're, we'll, we'll adjourn for now, but I appreciate Paul's uh, invitation to be here and I appreciate you all investing part of you, this just incredible day uh, to spend indoors uh, together and uh, I hope it was as meaningful for you as certainly as it was for me. So thank you so much. Thank you.